everyone thank you so much for joining us online for today's conversation with jamaica heoli meli kalani osorio and Teresa siangatonio we have a slight change to our lineup. Unfortunately, Noe Noe Silva is not able to join us, but we are thrilled to have Jamaica and Teresa here with us to celebrate Jamaica's book, Remembering Our Intimacies, Mo'olelo, Aloha Aina, and Ea. My name is Lily Philpott. I'm the programs manager at the Asian American Writers Workshop, and it is my great pleasure to welcome you to our virtual event space. A quick visual description of me. I have brown skin, short black hair that is pulled back, um, round glasses with black frames, and I am wearing a bright green sweater. This event is taking place across time zones, uh, so please do say hi and let us know in the chat where you're watching from. I am speaking to you today from Connecticut, where I am on ancestral and unceded Pequannock, Wappinger, and Pawgusset land. For those of you who are new to the AAWW, we are a national nonprofit organization dedicated to uplifting Asian and Pacific diasporic literature and storytelling. We hold frequent readings and conversations like this one, organize community arts programming in New York City high schools and senior centers, run fellowship programs for emerging writers of color, and publish an award-winning online literary magazine called The Margins. This year, we are celebrating our 30th anniversary with a campaign called AAWW at 30. This campaign will explore the values and ideas that lie at the heart of the workshop's mission. From the need for an artistic home to interrogating our editorial and archival legacies, this campaign will serve not only as a retrospective of our rich and layered history, but as a resounding call to envision our collective futures. You can find out more by visiting us at aaww.org or by following us on Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube, where the recording of this event will be posted. During this event, we ask that all audience members practice nonviolence in the chat. Comments that are racist, transphobic, homophobic, ableist, and or misogynist will be flagged and the person will be removed from this event. We will open our event with a reading from Remembering Our Intimacies, followed by a conversation, and then we'll have time for audience Q&A. So please do submit your questions via the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. I'll introduce Jamaica and Teresa briefly, and then we'll turn the mic over to Jamaica. Jamaica Heoli Mele Kalani Osorio is Assistant Professor of Indigenous and Native Hawaiian Politics at the University of Hawaii at Manoa, as well as an award-winning poet, musician, and a lifelong activist. Remembering Our Intimacies, Mo'olelo, Aloha Aina, and Ea was published by the University of Minnesota Press earlier this year. You can purchase a copy via the links in our chat from Books Are Magic or Native Books, both independent woman-owned bookstores based in New York and Hawaii, respectively. Teresa Siangatonu is an award-winning poet, teaching artist, mental health educator, and community leader born and rooted in the Bay Area. Her presence in the poetry world as a queer Samoan woman and activist has granted her opportunities to perform and speak in places ranging from the White House during the Obama administration to the UN Conference on Climate Change in Paris, France. The most memorable moment of her career was receiving President Obama's Champion of Change Award in 2012 for her activ activism, excuse me, as a spoken word poet and organizer in her Pacific Islander community. Thank you all so much again for being here and please join me in welcoming Jamaica on screen to read. Hello, my kako. Uh, like Lily said, my name is Jamaica Heori Mali Kalani Osorio. Um, a quick visual description of me, I have um, light brown skin, short hair, uh, I'm wearing a dark t-shirt that says hold the line, that was made by my partner, um, and a whale bone carved necklace that's carved in the shape of an ulu plant, and behind me is a beautiful black painting that says oya iho. Uh, today, I, thank you folks for being here, uh, I'm really excited to be talking about this book and um, 
and anything else really that Teresa wants to talk about today. Um, I'm going to be reading actually from the end of this text, um, the last kind of short story before the final chapter in this in this book. And, and this particular part of the book was written while we were living in the Malu of Mauna Awakea um, and struggling to protect our mountain from further encroachment uh, and desecration by the settler state. <clears throat> Ask me about the Mauna and I will tell you about 30 Kanaka huddled shivering in an empty parking lot, praying the Lahui would answer the call. I will tell you about two nights spent caught sleeping directly under a sky scattered in stars in air so clear, every inhale is medicine. How every morning I woke to a lahui kanaka growing as if we were watching Maui fish us one by one from the sea. Ask me about the mauna and I will tell you how on the third morning I watched as 30 became 100, then 100 became 1,000, then 1,000 became us all, each and every one of our kupuna standing beside us. Ask me about the mauna and I will tell you the mo'olelo of eight kanaka chained to a cattle grate and the kokua who sat beside us, how we were never alone in the malu of our mauna, how no one is ever alone in the malu of our mauna. Ask me, and I will tell you about the hands I held, to the blistering cold and extreme heat, how I learned love from the subtle tilt of her temple pressed against mine, or the solemn promise of her eyes, how the evening before I braided prayers into her hair, hoping they would hold. Ask me, and I will recount their names, all 38 of Kupuna who showed us Mo'opuna how to stand, how I wept and wept and wept as I quietly held their names in my chest. Ask me, and I will sing the song of our Manawahine, linked arms and unafraid who stood in the face of a promise of sound cannons and mace. Ask me, and I will tell you that I have been transformed here, but I won't have the words to quite explain. I will say, I don't know exactly who I will be when this ends. I don't know exactly who we will be when this ends, but at the very least, I'll know that this Aina did everything it could to feed me. That will be enough to keep me standing. On July 17th, 2019, I watched alongside my Lahui as 38 of our beloved Kupuna stirred fiercely in their aloha for our Aina and were hauled away by state and Hawaii County enforcement officers. Hundreds of thousands of people clung to their Facebook and Instagram live feed, while nearly a thousand kia'i lined the Alahulu Kupuna, the Maunakea access road, and flooded the Pahoi Hoi in our tears. Just two days earlier, on July 15th, the kia'i at the Pu'uhonua or Pu'uhuluhulu had reactivated a call to our Lahui to join us in the protection of our sacred Mauna when eight kia'i chained ourselves to the cattle guard on the access road, preventing the construction, the delivery of construction equipment. We laid there in the Maluan protection of our Mauna and our Lahui for 12 hours. The next morning, our members increased from a couple hundred to a thousand brave kia'i, ready to stand up and put their bodies between our mauna and any act of desecration. We stood proud, basking in the wealth of our, and brilliance of our people, but we also stood anxious because as our numbers grew, so did the numbers of enforcement officers and their weaponry and machinery. As we grew to possibly the greatest activation of our people since the Ku'e petition drive in 1897, we wondered if we would be met with a force that we, contemporary Kanaka, had never before encountered. In the wake of our rising wave, the state assembled an army of enforcement officers pulling from at least six separate agencies. And while these officers collected their weapons, our kumu, masters of ceremony, led us in the kahea of our akua. At this time, the state reveled in, revealed that in the face of all our mana and abundance, it only had force and violence to offer us. When July 17th, 2019 arrived, our Lahui was prepared as police took our kupuna, our elders, one by one, each empty seat was quickly filled by another kupuna ready to take a stand until no elders remain. The rest of us, their mo'opuna, gave the officers only our silence. Not even the satisfaction of our wailing grief would surround them. And as our silence grew, so did our manna. When the final kupuna were hauled away, their place flooded with hundreds of manawahine, supported by our kane and mahu at our backs. And again, our people controlled the road, controlled our destiny, and continued to protect our aina. When the manawahine took the road, we remembered the teachings of our kupuna. We sang our mele, chanted our oli, while some even danced our hula. We offered aloha and care to the police officers who struggled before us. 
We reminded them that we stood there for our children and their children. But most of all, we held tightly onto each other. We insisted that we would protect our Lahui as fiercely as we would protect our Mauna, that we understood in that moment how the two were the same. <clears throat> the next morning, the number of Kia'i who gathered at Pu'uhuluhulu had tripled. And day by day, we continued to grow as three to 5,000 Kanaka and allies answered the call to Kia'i Armona. The wealth of Ramana resounded across the Paiaina. We, meanwhile, the state cowered in its incompetence, spending more than $11 million in its threat to remove us from our ancestral lands. Today, our Kia'i continue to govern the Alahulu Kupuna um, with Aloha Aina. That ended with COVID-19, took a short hiatus. Um, our people are rising like a mighty wave and what we have accomplished cannot be cast aside. In fewer than three months, our movement brought thousands of people to the Mauna physically and hundreds of thousands virtually. Most of these kia'i had never stood in the malu of Mauna Awakea before. That's thousands of people who never had the opportunity to develop an intimate pilina to one of our most sacred aina. Through our collective ea and our commitment to aloha aina, we brought these kanaka home. And in doing so, we have cultivated in our people an intimacy with a part of our aina that we have been strategically estranged from. We have given Kanaka something back that has been taken away from us. Kanaka living around the world are not just reconnecting to Mauna Awakea, but also taking these lessons of Aloha Aina and Pilina to their home communities. This movement and the sacrifice of our elders pre prepared us for such a strong and unrelenting commitment. I believe it's only a matter of time until the 30 meter telescope corporation packs up its bags and departs our beautiful home. And on that day, we will have succeeded in protecting our Mona from this specific act of violence. But perhaps we should also remember that we are not simply standing in opposition to desecration. Rather, we are fearlessly committed to protecting our humanity and our ability to live, breathe, think, and act as our elders have for generations. What if protecting Aina is what makes us Kanaka in the first place? What if that is the wealth and lesson our ancestors of our ancestors that we cannot afford to lose? Mahalo. Ala Palava family, my name is Teresa Siangatanu. I'm calling in from the ancestral lands of the Ohlone people here in the Bay Area. Um, a visual description of me is that I'm wearing a navy blue dress with red stripes as well as coconut shell earrings and clear glasses. My hair is pulled back into a ponytail and yeah, and I'm excited to be here. <laughs> um, please give it up y'all in the chat. Um, just show love for Jamaica for just opening our space tonight with her words, um, starting with her poetry, starting with her truth. Um, please be in conversation with us so that it's not just us talking to each other. <laughs> Jamaica and I talk to each other all the time. <laughs> so <clears throat> we would love to tell and all with the village as we are gathered here tonight. Jam, hi. <laughs> hi, 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 Auntie Riri. Hi. How are you Good, how are you? I'm uh, doing great. How are things? How's the new baby? <laughs> the new baby is great. I think she's asleep in the other room. Um, I'm pretty stoked to see so many familiar names in the chat, yeah. um, students and friends and folks who stood on the Mona with us, um, pretty mean. Oh, I'm, I'm excited that everyone's giving you love. I hope you're looking at it right now. And thank you so much for evoking that word in a way that brought many of us back to that moment in July, 2019. Um, many of us, especially for those of us who aren't Kanaka, who aren't native to Hawaii, um, myself included, felt very called. We, we heard the kahea to go to the Mauna um, and stand um, alongside the Lahui in defense of not just um, Aloha Aina, but a lot of what you talk about in your book, this intimate relationship with one another um, mm -hmm. as well, right? I know that <clears throat> as a Samoan, as a, a fellow indigenous person to Oceania, um, I understand my kuleana, my responsibility to Native Hawaiians very clearly. Um, mm. thanks, thanks to to you, uh, in part to you, in, in part to all Native Hawaiians who stand so fiercely in the face of U.S. empire, 
in the face of militarism, in the face of a world that continues to desecrate and try to dispossess Native people, in which you say, Aole, <laughs> you say, no, <laughs> enough is enough, right? And so is it okay if we get into um, a central part of your book being Aloha Aina? I just have a few mm -hmm. questions that I just want to yeah. see how it lands on you if you want to explore them with me, if that's okay. <laughs> okay. Um, so I know Noe Noe Silva um, couldn't be here with us today, but I actually want to bring some of her words into conversation with us because you you um, pay tribute to her words in your chapter, Aloha Aina as Pilina. <laughs> So you talk about Aloha Aina is a central, is central to any mo'olelo of Hawaii because of your specific connection and relationship to land and how mm -hmm. that informs all Kanaka Maoli. Um, and so I, I was moved by the definition that you gave of Noe Noe Silva's in which she talks, she challenges the, um, the use of patriotism is often equated to Aloha Aina. Patriotism, nationhood, nationalism, in which she says, uh, where nationalism and patriotism tend to exalt the virtues of a people or a race, Aloha Aina exalts the land. Mm. And there's something you talk about around how Kanaka Maoli's Native Hawaiians articulation and practices of pilina and intimacy with each other are profoundly intertwined with their pilina and intimacy with Aina. And how this is what distinguishes Aloha Aina from other forms of nationhood and nationalism. Mm. Um, because of Hawaii's history of dispossession, you, you talk a lot about how this interpersonal intimacy, how you practice Kilina, must be restored as a central component of Kanaka Maoli nation building. Mm -hmm. And so my question, my initial question to you is, what is at stake if this interpersonal intimacy and how you practice Kilina isn't restored? And mm -hmm. how does it impact more than just Kanaka Maoli? Because I feel it in my bones, I feel it in my na'au, even mm -hmm. if I'm not Kanaka, so. What is at stake? What is the cost? And how does that impact um, more than just Kanaka? Oh, that's such a great question. And mahalo for bringing uh, Kumu Noi Noi's words into, into this space. I think that particular definition of Aloha Aina, of it, you know, exalting the land, really didn't just like blow my mind, but really changed the way a lot of us, especially those of us who are who are like Hawaiian scholars really started to talk and think and write about Aloha Aina as distinct from patriotism, right? Patriotism being this really kind of easy gloss for a word that otherwise doesn't really have much connection to what Aloha Aina is. Mm -hmm. um, for me, everything is at stake. If we don't take the Aloha, the intimacy of Aloha seriously in Aloha Aina. Um, and I think my interest in this really began as a queer wahine who, you know, has been, who has studied enough about social movements to see the way that queer people and women and, and trans people are often kind of cast aside in like the mainstream uh, thread of so many important social movements throughout the history of, let's just keep it like the United States, right? Or even in Hawaii, right? Haunani K. Trask writes about the, the misogyny she she experiences um, in the the battle to protect Koho Olave, right? So these aren't these are things that we are not immune from. Um, and I think about intimacy and relationships in Pilina as as essential to to the way we establish our principles of well our principles of everything, but essentially like our principles of what we will build. Mm -hmm. So if we do not take seriously the call to return to our, our ancestral practices of Pirina, our ancestral practices of recognizing um, our relationships to each other, so many of these relationships that have been strategically erased, policed, sanitized out of our communities um, through a really you know, violent experience uh, of colonialism, if we don't go back and like heal, do that healing, mm -hmm. All, I believe that all of our work is just going to reproduce the same kind of violence, right? We're, then what we're talking about is not transformation of systems. We're talking about getting more people who are brown, like us, holding positions of power in ways that disempower others, uh, that cause harm to others. And what Aloha Aina really asks us to do, uh, and this is something I learned from Nawahi, who is a, um, a 19th, 19th century Hawaiian scholar, um, Aloha Aina asked us to recognize the way that um, that is a magnetic pull, Aloha Aina is a magnetic pull to Aina, but it's also something that helps us recognize each other as comrades, 
Mm -hmm. um, and in that way, Aloha'ina makes community. And so when I think about that, and I think about some of the very first laws, um, official like laws that were written in the Hawaiian kingdom were around policing sexuality and around policing certain forms of intimacy, it, it dawns on me that that's going to be at the root of the work we need to do to heal and to build generative institutions of change uh, to create livable futures for the rest of us. Um, so everything, everything is at stake. We're not just talking about the queer parts of our communities who will be cast aside if we don't really take seriously our vision for a Hawaiian independent future. We are talking about like erasing whole numbers of us, people who look and love me um, and my homies. Mm -hmm. um, but, but, we're, but we're also failing to, to take seriously what loving Aina teaches us about how we're supposed to love each other. Um, and in that way, like, I don't know how we can be kanaka unless we can open, bring all that back together uh, into one body, into one practice. Um, I don't know if any of that made sense, but <laughs> that's what I'm thinking about right now um, in terms of Aloha'ina and, and why it matters. Uh, and, it, and it should matter, again, like it shouldn't just matter to us queer Pacific kids. Um, it should matter to all of us because essentially at, at the root colonialism and and it's you know major pillars capitalism militarism all this crap all of that's about disconnection mm -hmm. right disconnect people from land so that we can go and like um i don't know use land for target practice or i don't know fill a mountain with fuel tanks that are leaking above the aquifer right disconnect people from land so they can do that disconnect people from each other so that we don't gather in the same ways and see ourselves as kin um, so any way that we can inspire connection is revolutionary. And Aloha'ina is for Hawaiians, that's like the, that's the pico of connection. That's the, the umbilical cord, the center. Thank you so much, Jam. Y'all can help reflect back if she made any sense. She, she was making sense to me. I don't but... know if I made sense, guys. I have mom brain. <laughs> apparently i'm not allowed to claim because that's your mom brain uh -huh. that's my mom brain <laughs> great brain um no i'm sitting jam with everything so much um so much of what you're saying is actually tying back to um things that i've been reading in your book um particularly around this notion of um you know, for Kanaka Maoli, like taking sexuality and Pilina mm -hmm. seriously has has had significant ramifications for how we imagine and materialize our families, our homes, our communities, and above all, the nation. Um, and you have cited the indigenous queer theorist, Chris Finley, um, who reminds us that we must begin with indigenous queer theory in our decolonial work because mm -hmm. taking sexuality seriously as a logic of colonial power has the potential to further decolonize native studies and, and so on and so forth. Um, and just thinking about hetero, cis heteropatriarchy as this backbone of the normalization of this, the nuclear family and how we've come to understand ourselves and organize ourselves, right? Um, and how so much of what you're calling for in your book is to desecrate that, <laughs> um, desecrate womanhood as you say, right? Um, and I think that's what makes it such an exciting time to be indigenous. Um, to watch our people language, reclaim, revive, restore that which um, what we were brutally disconnected from starting mm. with the land. Mm. I say that as someone in diaspora who is constantly reckoning with this, what home means and mm. what a sense of belonging even means as someone who feels deeply indigenous to Samoa, but also questions that all the time around like, well, what does it mean if I wasn't born there? What does it mean if my, language skills aren't up to par and, and so on and so forth. And I, I'm reminded of something you said in a talk we gave previously this year around how uh, you're saying it in the context of capitalism and militarism and how they have managed to remap an entire ocean, our ocean. Mm -hmm. uh, so much so to the point of disconnecting us from each other and, our, and re, reworking our ability to even relate to one another, let alone to our own island nations, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, I think 
so, so I think many of our people, most of our people are on board with the understanding that, um, you know, our, our experience with colonialism is largely uh, rooted in in like a theft of land, right? And like that was the biggest thing that was stolen from us is our land and our autonomy over our land. And I'm not here to say that that's not true, um, but I am here to remind us that much of that was facilitated through a disruption of our relationships to each other. Um, and so when 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 we talk about the nuclear family and like big words like cis heteropatriarchy and and you know heteronormativity and home and all that stuff what i'm really thinking about is first of all this liar lilo who went around telling people that ohana means family um ohana doesn't mean family okay the family is this like very specifically constructed capitalist metric that's meant to like create organize society in a way that can produce the most for for the man for the nation right now we all have to live in this house with like two parents who are of opposite sexes with their two kids and their dog and their white picket fence and how all of that is about like generating a particular kind of economy mm -hmm. um and of course most of that was that like real family that virtuous family was only um was only allowed for like middle class white folks right so we could even get even deeper into this but if we if we take a few steps back before the arrival of missionaries and their weird rules about marriage and virtue what you see is an organizational structure that is far more complex far more nuanced and incredibly expansive so that when when the nuclear family comes it literally just like cuts our community into pieces so where there once was when we talk about right it takes a village to raise a child and i think about this all the time because parenthood being a parent is hard keeping a baby alive is difficult but i think about my kupuna um who lived generations before us who a child would have many makua right anyone a generation above them would be a parent a makua uh, we didn't have this thing called auntie and uncle who are somehow um, a couple degrees removed from the responsibility of rearing and caring for this child. They were all makua in the same way that like everyone in the same generation as you was um, was a sibling, was either an elder or a younger person of your generation. Mm -hmm. I think about what that kind of society enabled and required in terms of how we behave in relation to each other that we obviously are not living with today. Um, that you are so accountable to more than just like, I got to get mine, you know, I got to like handle my family. Um, no, I am accountable to everything that I touch and every person who I love and every person who has loved me and every person who loves my child or who loves my partner is someone who I must love and care for and hold space for. Um, and capitalism cannot account for that because it doesn't know like how to charge you rent in that system. Um, and so like that remapping has been really violent. And of course um, we can think more, even more expansively about this and how this has affected Oceania and the Pacific and thinking about those webs of relations that have been so violently disrupted in particular by militarism and, and in particular by Western imperialism in the, in the way that, um, you know, where we once, I once might have been able to have a, a really beautiful and generative conversation with someone from um, from Tahiti, uh, them speaking Maohi and me speaking Olelo, and now they're speaking French and I'm speaking English and like literally there is no communication. Right. Um, and where there is no communication, where can there be kinship? Um, so yeah, I don't know. I, I may be getting a little off course here, but all of that, to me, that says all, everything we must do has to be about reestablishing those relationships. Mm. Just giving room to take that in. Um, part of what I see you doing, not just in this book, but in your life, because I've known you for like 12 years, <laughs> Um, is, but definitely in this book, is subscribing to this politics of refusal. Hmm. Um, 
where you're invoking and articulating instances of aloha aina in the mo'olelo without succumbing to the pressure to reduce to a supposed English equivalent. You're like, nope, I'm not doing that. This is not that book. <laughs> you mentioned that if you're successful at this, that then your methods should allow aloha aina not only to suffice, but to resonate accurately and fully because it escapes translation. Mm. And I love that you even dropped a website that folks can use. <laughs> they want a resource to survey definitions of Hawaiian terms. You're like, you go do the work. I'm not about to define every part of my people's language in this book. Um, and I love that. And I wanted to talk more about this politics of refusal with you mm -hmm. as it relates to not just, again, what you accomplish in the languaging of this book, but also in how you move in the world as a scholar, as an activist, as a kiai, as a poet, as a mother, as a daughter, as my friend. I want to hear more about how what you are principled by informs the necessity for a politics mm -hmm. of refusal in the first place. Oh, that's such a good question. I think um, my mom would tell everyone that my first act of refusal was saying no more dresses. Um, it's probably like my full first sentence was no more dresses, mom, which was uh, admittedly really devastating for her, but she complied mostly. Um, it's This is such a great question because I'm not actually sure what has inspired my kind of uh, personality of refusal more but I but I what I can say about the choices in the book I think first is you know in writing the book I on the one hand you know wanted to write it in a way where where it would speak to a wide audience but it was always very clear to me who my primary audience was this book was is a is a gesture of love to my lahui um, and when I say that, I, I don't just mean other Hawaiians, and of course I include other Hawaiians, but I mean, you know, other queer wahine, mahu, trans folk from the Pacific um, and beyond, but like always starting at home in the Pacific. I mean, other people of color who have been fighting under the weight of imperialism for, for generations. And I feel like we've always had to do so much, not I feel like, I know like we've had to always do so much extra work right like we got to do their like the white people's work and we got to do our own work and we were trained growing up those of us who are scholars like if you don't understand a word look it up but no one ever does that with our shit right everyone just expects us to do the work for them um so a part of that refusal in the book is like you're reading a book read it with the same kind of rigor you would read a book written by a white dude right when when like Foucault writes shit you don't understand you look it up you ask questions, you reread it again. Um, and I want people to come to our work with the same kind of intensity and the same kind of rigor. Um, but there's, I think that connects to a larger kind of trend in my life that I've learned primarily from organizers and primarily from paying close attention to, you know, uh, frontline activists from Black Lives Matter to No DAPL to uh, Protect Mauna Awakea, who have really straddled the line brilliantly between um, between negotiation with the powers that be and the status quo to try to mitigate harm and outright refusal. And the as I think it's Leanne Simpson who calls it uh, generative refusal. This like creating this space where we can create something else because specifically because of our refusal. Um, and the hope is that the book is like kind of trying to model what really amazing organizers are doing in real time in real space in like a small way in the text. Because what's made possible for Alohaina when I don't just tell you it means love for the land? Like what's possible in your mind when you hear that word and I just describe it? Like I describe the way that Hiyaka is an aloha aina. And I describe the way that um, Antipua case is an aloha aina. Um, who will that call up for you that I might have foreclosed mm -hmm. if I had gave, given it uh, an English gloss? Um, because there is no neutral language, mm -hmm. right? If I, if I call it patriotism, like that may make you, Teresa, someone who is like me, pretty critical of the military, like not want to associate with this thing called the Lahaina. Um, and I think we only learn that, I think I only learned that from watching the, the brilliant outpouring and incredible strategy and tactics of frontline organizers, especially in the last 
you know, the last five years that I've been paying really close attention. Obviously, they've been doing this for generations, but I've been paying closer attention. Um, so they, that goes hand in hand. Thank you for that, Jim. I think something that also feels like it goes hand in hand and let me know if it doesn't or if there's something to stand on around it is, is being a poet um, alongside being a scholar, being a professor, like doing language in different realms um, that make it so that you can sharpen your politics of refusal even more so. Um, because oftentimes it, it is artists who are in the business of risk taking and saying the bold, courageous thing that a lot of other mediums cannot say or do. And I want to talk more about, or just hear from you around your experience of, of being both, of like, what does it mean to get creative in the academy <laughs> um, in ways in which a lot of these texts um, can be really inaccessible or daunting um, at face value, but, um, but it, it could be also very inviting in a creative way that pushes us to imagine um, these alternatives, um, alternatives to existing models of nation statehood as you talk about in the book. Yeah, you know, I, I feel like there are a lot of things about the way that I was raised that, that prepared me for this work and made me see the world in, in a very like, the world and the academy as this creative space. And I, I think about, who my father is as an artist and a scholar and an activist. And I think about the people my parents surrounded me with, like Auntie Haunani K. Trask and Auntie Teresia Te Iowa and Uncle Albert Went, who are all scholars and artists. And how to me, they it, there weren't any examples of scholars who weren't artists growing up. So I actually thought it was the work. Um, there weren't any examples to me of activists or orators, people giving speeches at the rally who weren't artists. Mm -hmm. So these things never felt separate to me until I entered the academy. Mm -hmm. And I felt myself constantly having to be pulled in these different directions and constantly having to translate my work for a particular audience in order to just like make it through. Um, Professor Chuck Lawrence calls this, you know, the, the passing and trespassing in the academy how we as people of color have to um, have to do both. If you want to be successful in the academy, it's the balance between passing and trespassing. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I guess what I what I really hope that this this book would do and to a larger extent, actually, this work started in the dissertation was one, I wanted to write something that people who I cared about would actually want to read it. And I don't know how many of you folks have read dissertations, but even some of the dissertations written by some of the most wonderful people, um, they're just, they're not fun to read because they're written for an audience. Like, I love my dad and I love my dad's writing, but his dissertation is not fun to read. <laughs> um, it's not beautiful in the way that his writing is often outside of that space so beautiful and haunting. Um, and so there was also a little bit of a, you know, um, there was an activist bent to the writing process in that one, I wanted to show other students around me and my future students that you don't have to write the way that the academy says you have to write. And all you really need is a few people in your corner who you trust who will fight for you. Um, and then again, so this is about community. It's not about Haoli writing the book she wants to write. It's about Haoli being surrounded by people like Noi Noi Silva, and, and Craig Howes and um, Ku'olo Ho'omabunui who will stand by my creative process as a critical process, as a scholarly process. Um, and I think that's really important because I think if we're gonna change anything, one, about the academy or to a larger extent the world, uh, we have to stop pretending that art and creativity aren't at the center of that. Mari Matsuda, brilliant, artist, legal scholar, um, one of the founding thinkers of critical race theory has reminded us time and time again that it's the artist that will save the world. Mm -hmm. um, and all, and, and that is because artists tell the truth as best that they can. Mm -hmm. When the rest of the world is afraid to tell the truth, an artist tells the truth. And when I think about that, I think about how Nani K. Trask, who always said things before people were ready to hear them. 
Mm. And to me, that was that was not just a part of her her fire and her fervor. It was a part of her being an artist mm -hmm. because she was at the cutting edge of every space that she moved in. Um, when she said, "We are not American," in front of thousands of Hawaiians in 1993. They didn't respond to that in the way that we respond to that today. Uh, we have to remember that. And art, artists, the creatives, the poets, the writers, the, the painters, the muralists, the sculptors, they're the ones who have the, we're the ones who have the skill set to actually create something. Um, and when we talk about movement building, when we talk about the future, we're talking, as any abolitionist scholar will tell you, we're talking about a creative process. So um, stop trying to kill the artists around you. Uh, stop trying to like take away their metaphors and take away their the beauty of their writing and the hauntingness of their writing. Um, there is transformation in that work. Ooh. Need another moment to take it in. <laughs> um, <clears throat> just on that last point, thank you so much, Jim. Uh, gosh, all of the points. But just on that last point, it reminded me of um, Toni Morrison's essay, Peril, in which she, she talks so much about how, um, you know, like authoritarians, like regimes, mm -hmm. <laughs> like um, head of states, they're not stupid. They're not they're not one to release um, all power to the writers and to artists because they do so at their own peril, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, when we talk about freedom dreaming or just like what life looks like um, after we get our land back, <laughs> once this empire crumbles, mm -hmm. um, it's an exciting time to also not just be indigenous, but, but to be an indigenous artist and just be an artist in general for whoever whoever's in that business of risk with us, right? Where mm -hmm. artists are oriented to thinking about connectedness, thinking about liberation differently. We're supposed to be doing that, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and doing that work and bridging the gap between where our communities stand on the fence and, and where they stand opposed to these, our, our, our audacity to dream and bring ourselves to a world beyond this one. Mm. Um, mentioning abolition, would we would be remiss to not mention um, the Black abolitionists, the Black women who have fine-tuned this framework for centuries to bring Absolutely. us to even a point where we're even considering defunding the police, right? Um, mm -hmm. Even considering what it means to have alternatives to calling 911 and so on and so forth. And I'm, I'm tying this back to Mauna Kea because there is just something so powerful about that experience for, that I felt personally in which everything that the state said was impossible regarding free healthcare, free food, mm -hmm. housing, free education, Kanakamali made possible <laughs> in a matter of days, weeks, with thousands of people standing be beside them to provide free healthcare, free education, free food, free elderly care um, in ways that made it so that maybe we were in a post-revolutionary moment, um, even if it was just a moment, right? Yeah. And and I'm sorry, I just want to jump in real quick. And just by that, this is that's the point I try to make a lot these days and remind people a lot of these days that like we had all that stuff that the state said we can't have in a matter of days. Everywhere they said we lacked, we brought abundance. And then and so that means in a lot of ways, uh, especially in the ways that we were like responding to the police and you know managing safety without police, obviously because they were a threat to our safety. Um, in a lot of these ways, we need more of our people to understand that that moment was a revolutionary moment, but it was also an abolitionist moment. Right. Uh, and Mauna Kea at its root then, and the things that were created, these were abolitionist institutions. So a lot of our people who feel really uncomfortable with that, you know, defunding of the police or abolishing of the police need to understand that you were a part of an abolitionist movement, whether we called it that or not. Um, and so there's potential there too, I think, of growth and 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 kind of continuing to push that boundary. Sure. Sorry, I cut you off though. No, you didn't. I didn't have a question. I just wanted. I was just vibing with you. Um, 
I am conscious of time and wanted to see if this was the right time to fold in any of the Q&A questions, Lily. What do you think? Yeah, I think that sounds great. Um, and I wanna, I will thank you both again, but I just, I'm trying to not put all of my thoughts in the chat. So it's not just me spamming everything, but there's so much to sit with and think through here. And I'm so incredibly grateful for this conversation. Um, I do have a couple of questions that were sent in the chat. If anyone who is listening has other questions, please do put them in the chat and the Q&A box and we will get to them. Um, you sort of touched on this first one already, but there's a question about um, the inclusion of poetry in the book Jamaica alongside the scholarly work and what that editorial process was like actually with it's the University of Minnesota Press and um, I, I am a, I'm making an assumption, but assuming it wasn't, you know, Kanaka Mali editors that you were working with, so I'm interested in hearing um, how they handled the manuscript and, and what that was like. Yeah, uh, this is a great question. Uh, there are two things about the manuscript that I was really ready to fight about because I like a good fight. Uh, one of them was the refusal to do long form translation. So those of you who pick up the book, you'll notice that like anytime there's a block of text in Hawaiian, there is not an English block of text right after. Um, that was one thing I, I thought, oh, this could be a huge fight because this has never been done before. No press, no English press has ever allowed you to just put a whole block of a foreign language and not translate it. Uh, the other thing was the inclusion of the poetry and the more um, kind of creative prose parts of the manuscript. I am disappointed to, um, to tell all of you there was no fight at all. Uh, the University of Minnesota was uh, beyond wonderful. My acquisitions editor, Jason Weedman, um, originally I had taken the manuscript to Duke. And, and this is not to say anything bad about Duke. I think they're a wonderful press, but I, I took it to Duke and they said, you know, we feel like your book meditates too much on the Mo'o level. And in that moment, I knew like it wasn't worth it to even try to figure out what that meant. I knew that it wasn't the right place for this book. When I sent it to Jason um, at University of Minnesota and Jason's worked with a lot of other Kanaka Maoli writers, uh, my colleague, Noila Nikodirka-Opua published a book with him. I think Ku'ulo Ho'omanavanui's book was published with him. Um, but I didn't really know anything about him. I sent him the manuscript and he said, this is wonderful. Uh, we would love to publish it. Um, and that was it. Every time that I thought they were going to say we need to like change things, they, they never wanted to change anything. Um, I will say that is very, very, um, un this is an unlikely experience for most indigenous and Pacific and certainly Hawaiian scholars. Um, so I know the question didn't ask for advice, but if anyone wanted my advice, it is that um, if, you know, if you're trying to get something published, and I know there are so many barriers for folks like us to get published that it can be really scary to turn away from folks who say they'll publish your work. Um, but I think it's important to protect your work um, and to protect your uh, poetics and to protect the aesthetics of your work and to say no if it's if they're trying to change what the work is doing. Um, and luckily, I mean, I guess, there are more and more of us in the publishing space and just trying to find those pu'uhonua, those places of refuge for our work because they do exist, I guess, is the moral of the story. It does exist even though there aren't that many of us who are acquisitions editors or whatever it is. Um, so yeah, sorry, boring story. They were really great. <laughs> oh, that's amazing. I'm actually, I'm totally thrilled to hear that. And I love that idea that just phrase places a refuge for the work. I'm so glad that um, that your experience was like that. Um, there is a great question from, it's Olani in the Q&A, which says, how can we support each other as native Hawaiians on days other than large events? For instance, the idea that percentage of your Hawaiian equates to your worth as a native Hawaiian. I understand this percentage idea is a colonial term, but many of our people put value on this percent. Oh yeah, this is a, a super important question. Um, you know, th that question, how much Hawaiian are you, was really common when I was growing up. It's a little less common now because people are starting to realize that um, it's a ridiculous question to ask, or at least it's an embarrassing question to ask because it's like telling on yourself. Um, how do we support each other? I think 
we need to continue to like tell these stories um, and, and remind each other that what makes us Kanaka, what makes us Hawaiian, what makes us Pacific is our relationships to each other, um, which is another reason it doesn't matter to me if a Hawaiian was born and raised in California or Paris, France, for that matter, um, if they have if they have ancestors who are Hawaiians and they are trying to build relationships with other Hawaiians, then they are Hawaiians, um, that they are tied to this place. Um, and that's kind of where we need to lead in the like kind of, you know, day to day people putting the weight on the percentage of Hawaiians. I know I know it's difficult as someone who is not more than 50 percent Hawaiian. Right. And that's like the, the benchmark for like real Hawaiian because then you can get Hawaiian homelands, someone who's not that. Um, there's definitely a lot of insecurity in myself growing up around if I was Hawaiian enough. And I'm reminded by scholars, again, like Leanne Simpson, who's always calling us to like not side with the colonizer. And when we put any kind of value on blood quantum um, and we use blood quantum at all to negotiate our relationships with each other, we're siding with the colonizer. We don't need to do their work for them. We don't need to create more disconnection or more fear or more insecurity. Um, and that's why, of course, like we can't only support each other at these big events and spaces, but that's another reason why the movement to protect Mauna Kea and especially the Pu'uhonua, uh, the place of refuge at Pu'uhuluhulu was so important because it was the first place in my life where nobody was asking that question, am I Hawaiian enough? Um, or is it okay that I'm here? In fact, hundreds of people came up to me over the course of months saying, you know, I wasn't here in 2015 because I didn't feel like I was Hawaiian enough, uh, yeah. but I felt called. And now I know why, like, I know why I'm supposed to be here. And so a, a part of the work of remembering who we are as Kanaka is remembering who we are in relation to each other. Uh, and that's going to come by being with each other. And of course that's, got all kinds of challenges now because of COVID. Um, but in case anyone needs to hear it, uh, your blood quantum doesn't matter. Doesn't matter if you're 100% Hawaiian or 13% Hawaiian, whatever the hell that means. Um, if you have one Hawaiian kupuna, you're Hawaiian. And that's all that mattered to them. That's all that's gonna matter to our grandkids. Um, anything else is just distraction. So, I need to like sit with that for a minute. I am also indigenous living in diaspora and that is just I'm grateful for that. Um, there's a question from Naomi in the chat saying, as indigenous authors, how do you approach the fellow scholars in your field with opposing ideals? I'm between that to, to either. Yeah. Of you. Okay. Teresa, do you want to, do you want to jump in on that? <laughs> I was gonna, no, I was going to answer for you. He, he fights them. That's what Jamaica does. <laughs> he, he goes on Twitter and. <laughs> and like, no, you answer. <laughs> um, how do I approach Phyllis? Well, first of all, hi, Naomi. Naomi's my student. Um, uh, I don't know if she's here for, for extra credit or just because she loves us, but either way, welcome. Um, how do you approach fellow scholars? We, so difference, dissent is important. Difference of opinion, uh, difference of approach is important and inspires growth. I think there are, there are a lot of people in our Lahui who I have very different ideas from and we can continue to build with each other and struggle with each other uh, because we have common ground. Um, that's different than because I'm, I'm an indigenous scholar and author working in a colonial violent colonial space that's different than like racist people or sexist people or homophobic people and like how i deal with those folks is i no longer care about anything they think or about anything that they do and that's actually only possible because i have been lucky enough to be a part of community so as an indigenous person in a place that is historically violent to indigenous people uh, and ongoing violence to indigenous people, uh, the the most important approach is making community, uh, creating safe spaces for you and, and folks like you who may not think exactly like you, but have the similar principles. 
um, who can org organize around Aloha Aina as a foundational principle and let that take you where it's going to take you. And then you can disagree on all the other stuff. Um, we do not have the institutional power at this point to outnumber uh, those in, in our society and, and in the academy who are white supremacist, homophobic assholes. Um, so for me, the best approach is to just try to make them as irrelevant as possible, to not give them more energy than they need to have. They have plenty of power already. For the most part, we can do our work over here while they're doing their racism over here and just address them whenever necessary. But spending too much time thinking about how to approach them, how to change their mind is again, just distraction. Um, it's not the work. Yeah, Teresa, not the work. Not the work, yeah, I'm agreeing. <laughs> work. We don't have time. We yeah. Have, like, there's just no time for that work to persuade, educate, you know, convince folks who, you know, like, but, and to have a strong discernment of who your people are. Like, you mm -hmm. know, Savai, a uh, um, fellow Samoan organizer, sister of ours always says, you know, we, we go hard on systems, but we're tender with each other. Mm -hmm. um, you have that discernment as you're doing, as you're doing the work, then you know, what, it's very clear what you're principled by um, in terms of who you're accountable to, what you're accountable to, um, and very little room for, for all of your nonsense. That's not our work. <laughs> I think, you know, what you brought up, what Tafai says about going hard on systems and being tender with each other is an important reminder though, because especially in, in our community, in the Native Hawaiian community, there are often times when we are hard on systems and hard on each other, myself included. And that again is like, not really, that's why you shouldn't follow me on Twitter because that's where I'm just hard on everything and everyone for no reason, I'm kind of just an asshole. Um, but again, like if, if the work is about intimacy, then doing things that build connection and build relationship even across difference in whatever we conceive of as our people is going to be really important and that requires vulnerability and tenderness um and that's hard because it's it's kind of easy to just tell someone well f you you're a sellout um because that's an ending not a beginning so think about how the work you can do will create beginnings rather than endings. <laughs> Don't follow Jamaica on Twitter. <laughs> if you're curious, Jamaica's Twitter handle is, is in the Zoom chat. <laughs> Thank you, Teresa. <laughs> Um, I want to be conscious of our time. So I thought one more question that we try and end our workshop events with. And then actually, Teresa, I wanted to give the last question to you if you have any other questions for Jamaica to kind of close out our, our hour, which may go slightly over with, but we'll try and keep it short. Um, we try, and you've already both, you've both done a, an incredible job of this already, but I love to end our events just calling absent friends into this space. Um, friends who have passed on, friends you work with, um, family members, colleagues, just anyone in your circle who you'd like to make our audiences aware of, um, whose work has inspired your own. And I'd love to hear from both of you if there are a couple of names that you'd like to draw in that you have not already. Yeah. Um, do you want to go first, Teresa? Nope. No? Okay. Well, I'm going to, I'm going to bring Oh, I'm going to bring two, whatever, uh, because I'm going to bring Kumu Haunani K. Trask into this space uh, because I'm always thinking about her, um, but also because she she really pushed our people to be internationalist in a sense. She always reminded us to see our struggle as connected to a wider struggle against imperialism um, and the violence of militarism. And, you know, she she was she studied other liberatory movements and much of her work was inspired by by the work of Malcolm X and the Black Panthers and and so she's just a really important person to all of us that if you don't know who she is you need to know who she is and, and she passed away this past year um and so I just I just want to say her name and then and the other person is um Teresia Te Iowa who I've been yeah. I know that's why I asked you if you want to go first because I knew you so you can say why you want to say her later too <laughs> that's fine. um I'm thinking a lot about Auntie Terry these days because um, I'm thinking a lot more about nuclear testing in the Pacific and, and militarism and, and again like the way that our entire ocean has been 
remapped and destroyed by the military industrial complex uh, because these white dudes want to, I don't know, conquer the world. Um, but I, I also want to bring her into the space because she was so <laughs> tender. Um, she was so fierce and so tender at the same time. And um, if you don't know her work, check out bikinis and other specific notions. I'll, I'll type it in the chat because it's got some weird spelling, um, but it'll blow your mind. Teresa, sorry, I stole your person. It's okay. I'm just gonna, I'm gonna build off of it because I don't think we can talk about Teresia enough. Um, but Teresia Teo is also one that I name as a auntie, as a, as a mentor, as someone who we dearly loved as a poet, um, as someone of Fijian, Kiribati, Black descent, who um, taught me through her work how colonial the classroom is and um, asking us like, is it even possible to indigenize the classroom? And mm -hmm. then reminding us that the Pacific is too vast to even fit into the, the confines of a, a, a four wall classroom. And I, there was a sense of peace that came over me as I was in grad school after reading that article and sitting with her work, sitting with her poetry, sitting with her words um, that reminded me that I'm enough and mm -hmm. I'm, beyond what the academy can actually hold of me um, with our water, with our people, with our salt. And it made me a better, sharper um, scholar, poet, um, woman of the Pacific. And so Teresia for sure. And then um, up it went, Samoan poet, elder of ours, mm. um, socialist, like leftist, like really awesome guy <laughs> whose poetry and the way he languaged Oceania um, just bettered my own ability to language the world and language my own stories. Um, just remembering that I come from a lineage of fierce Samoan um, oral tradition and, and orators who um, remind me that this, this work isn't new, but it is the work. And so it makes me excited to know that that's the lineage we come from. Thank you both. Um, I just, Teresa, I do want to turn over the final question to you. And I just have to say, I love how much, I love so much the way you verb the word language. You've done it all night or it's nighttime where I am, but I, it's just so beautiful. It, every time you do it, it's like, it's really so lovely. Um, but yes, I do want to turn the final question over to you. Thanks, Lou. I appreciate that. Um, final question is actually just a ghost line for you to finish like a writing prompt on the spot. And so I'm scared. I want to play, <laughs> I want to place us in that world and in, in that world that we reach after this one, um, that world of liberation, of freedom, of justice, however we define it, right? And so I want you to finish the statement however way you want. It could be one line, it could be numerous lines. It could be, it could be a poem. <laughs> It could be a call to action, it could be a kahea, but the line is, we knew we were liberated when. Mm. We knew we were liberated when, Jan. Uh, we knew we were liberated when our daughters no longer had fear. Mm. We knew we were liberated when our daughters no longer had fear. Thank you also for dropping that in the chat. I invite everyone on the on the call to answer that for yourselves, to come to this world with us and um, have Jam's word, Jamaica's words lead us, um, that we knew we were liberated when our daughters no longer had fear. It was a really beautiful, powerful way to end our time tonight. Jam, yeah. thank you so much. I love you. I love you so much. Thank you guys. Thank you both so much. This is so, I think that is the perfect way to end. And I just want to thank as well quickly our incredible pro bono ASL interpreters, Jenna, who's on screen right now, and Jesus, who was on screen earlier this evening. Um, thank you both. And thank you as always to pro bono ASL for helping us make our events accessible. Um, as Teresa just suggested, please, please do respond to that prompt in the chat. We're going to keep the Zoom open for a moment. We'll play a little bit of music and put the slides back on screen, um, but we will be here with you in the chat and do hope that you will respond. Um, but thank you so much. Thank you, Teresa, for guiding this conversation so beautifully. Thank you, Jamaica, for this book, for your work, for everything. Um, yeah.
please, please buy a copy. My colleague will post links to purchase the book um, in the chat. And thank you both so much. We'll be in the chat for a bit. And just I'm so grateful for both of you. Thank you. Mahalo. Have a good evening. Thank you.